Um, freedom of the press is a major cornerstone of civil society. It's in complete alignment with free speech, hard to operate without free speech, the free right to assemble, the free right to protest. And increasingly it's being called the enemy of the people, which is a tragedy because freedom of the press is critical, not just for the journalists who want to deliver the news, but for consumers, for citizens who need access, who have a right to access to what is going on, uncensored. I have personally lived in police states where people didn't even bother to read the newspapers because they know they knew it did no good. Uh, so I think you will enjoy this evening's program. Um, and we particularly look forward to your questions when we do our public Q&A. And, and um, that'll be very, very exciting. I want to introduce Judy Hagan. Our two board members, Judy Hagan and Ian McIntosh, will be helping to moderate this program this evening. And Judy, would you please introduce our speakers? Thank you, Betty. I'd be happy to. Press freedom is under attack around the world. Our distinguished speakers are literally on the front lines of this issue around the world, and tonight will share their perspectives. Stephen Youngblood is director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University. Lucy Westcott is director of emergencies for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Let's learn a little bit more about Lucy, who will be our first distinguished speaker this evening. Lucy Westcott is a reporter and journalist who became director of the Emergencies Department of the Committee to Protect Journalists in 2021. In that role, she oversees their assistance and safety network worldwide. Lucy originally joined the committee as a James W. Foley Fellow. You will remember the, fellow, uh, the fellowship was named after James Foley, the American freelance reporter who was kidnapped in Syria in 20. 12 and murdered in 2014. Last year, Lucy Westcott played a prominent role in the committee's response to the Afghan crisis, including helping Afghan journalists and their families evacuated to Qatar. Prior work includes staff writer for Newsweek, covering gender and immigration issues, reporting for news outlets, including The Intercept, Bustle, The Atlantic, and Women Under Siege. She was the, a United Nations correspondent for the Interpress Service. Lucy has reported from around the world. She has a master's in multi-platform journalism from the University of Maryland and a bachelor's degree from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. Lucy, would you begin our distinguished speaker's evening by going first? Thank you so much, Judy, for that very kind introduction. And it is lovely to be here with everyone this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So just bear with me one second. All right, more share screen. Okay. And I'm gonna go into a slideshow. And is that working? We can see the screen, we can see yep. the screen. Lovely. Excellent. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for being here, everyone. Um, thank you very much to Judy and Ian for fantastic coordination and organization of this panel. And thank you very much to Steve um, as well, my fellow panelist. We are thrilled to be here. Um, I will be speaking with you this evening about an evergreen issue, and that is press freedom in crisis. And I will give a little bit of information about the organization that I work for, the Committee to Protect Journalists, where really we are at the heart of this issue every single day. Uh, the CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, is uh, an independent nonprofit organization based here in New York City. We defend the rights of journalists to report the news safely and without fear of reprisal wherever we are and we protect the rights of journalists to report on the news safely wherever they are. We were founded in 1981. Uh, we are based in New York, as I said, but we have correspondents all around the world. We have a three-pronged approach to the way that we uh, address press freedom and help the journalists that we engage with. Uh, we conduct first-hand reporting and we document cases of press freedom violations all around the world whether that's an arrest of a journalist, whether that's um, a lawsuit, of course, the killing of a journalist, and I will get more into that later. 
Uh, we also advocate on behalf of journalists and of press freedom issues as well. So we have an entire advocacy department uh, who works on that. And we provide in my role, um, individual support for journalists, that's financial support, but also non-financial support. Um, and we provide a lot of safety information for journalists and newsrooms in multiple languages. And I will get onto that very shortly. Um, I will be speaking today about three areas um, concerning press freedom that definitely my department, the emergencies department, um, but the whole organization really at CPJ has, has dealt with a fair bit over the, uh, over the past year or so. Um, and I will just give a brief um, background as well to my department, J uh, James Foley, of course, uh, the American journalist who was killed at the hands of ISIS militants in 2014. Um, his death, the death of American journalist Stephen Sotloff and of many freelance journalists during that crisis prompted um, the, uh, the establishment of my department. We noticed that there were a lot of freelance journalists going to cover that violence and, and that crisis, and there was not um, a lot of institutional support for them. So this department, my department, was created to really fill that gap. And that is kind of the, the history um, and where that department comes from. So the name, of course, of this panel is Press Freedom in Decline. Um, and very sadly, that is true. I have been at CPJ for about four and a half years, and I can say that things have generally um, gotten worse over that time. Uh, I do think that the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated press freedom uh, crises and a lot of the press freedom restrictions around that particular uh, crisis, especially at the beginning, really did accelerate that change. Um, and we're still seeing that today. But how do we measure uh, press freedom and decline? What are we looking at exactly? If we zoom in on just the past week um, of CPJ reporting, I'll give you just a brief overview so you can really see how global this is and the types and the breadth of press freedom violations that we do cover at CPJ. We've seen a journalist arrested in Egypt for reporting on the arrest of Egyptian journalist Ala Abdel Fattah. I'm sure many of you have uh, seen his case reported on in the news. He recently broke uh, quite a long hunger strike in prison. We've also reported on the death of Haitian journalist Romselson Vissin in Haiti. Um, this is the fifth journalist to be killed in Haiti in relation to their work this year. We are continuing to report on press freedom violations in Afghanistan. Um, and a few days ago, we issued uh, an alert on armed men who beat two journalists, leaving one unconscious. And we have also reported on legal action against a journalist in Senegal uh, who was arrested for reporting on a leaked document. So as you can see, this is a global issue. There are uh, violations of reporting on every single day. I want to just take a, a brief moment as well to discuss or talk about Iran. Um, I'm sure that many of you here know this is an ongoing crisis. Uh, since the, the death of Masa Amini, the young woman in police custody in September. To date, CPJ has documented uh, the arrests of more than 60 journalists in Iran related to the protests and to this ongoing unrest. And Iran has more women journalists in jail than any other country in the Middle East. Um, this is something that we are dealing with every single day at CPJ. We have colleagues who are directly affected by this particular crisis. Um, it's important to highlight just how, you know, how high these numbers are, um, and we continue to call for their immediate release. So I just wanted to take a, a beat there to talk about Iran. One of the main ways um, that we see press freedom and decline is jail, jail journalists and the number of journalists who are in prison. We are um, about to, in a couple of weeks, release CPJ's new statistics on the number of journalists in prison worldwide. We do this on December the 1st every single year. So I can speak about our current statistics. Um, and what I can say is that, uh, you know, the numbers are trending in the wrong direction when we get to, to our new census. Currently, there are a record number of journalists in prison. 293 journalists globally, the majority of those journalists are imprisoned in Asian countries. Um, that's the highest number since we began keeping records. Um, the top three countries will likely come as no surprise to anyone on this call. It's China, Myanmar, and Egypt. Um, Iran is on last year's list with 11 journalists in prison. 
So if we think about those 11 journalists in prison in 2021 and these 60 journalists who have been arrested in just two months, that really uh, illustrates how severe the crisis is currently in Iran. We also keep a tally of journalists who have been killed every single year. Again, we release this new data on De uh, December the 1st every single year. Um, but what I can tell you is currently, uh, India is the top uh, country where the most journalists have been killed, followed by Mexico and Afghanistan. In 80% of these cases, uh, the, the um, and we continue to report on the fact that there, there are many journalists who are killed with impunity. Of course, that sends a chilling message to journalists that if they report and somebody doesn't like it and they are killed for their reporting, um, there are not always consequences and the perpetrator is not always brought to justice. You'll see here I have listed um, just a few countries where we continue to work in, um, in terms of dealing with crises, so ongoing crises involving journalists. We provide assistance, assistance to journalists all over the world um, every single day, but these countries in particular um, are taking, you know, we are giving a lot of assistance, a lot of safety information. Journalists are fleeing these particular countries because of the threats made against them. I have mentioned Iran, um, Afghanistan, which we were very heavily involved in last year around the time of August 15th and the Taliban takeover. We continue to hear from journalists daily in, uh, in Afghanistan who want to leave, who are facing threats. I mean, life is very difficult for them. Um, it goes without saying the war in Ukraine is absolutely a press freedom crisis. We also know that there has been something of a mass exodus of Russian journalists in response to um, legislation uh, or so-called fake news legislation around the criminalization of journalism and uh, on the ongoing crisis in Myanmar as well. I will move on then to um, journalist safety, which is a large part of my job and what I personally do at CPJ. I've spoken a bit about press freedom and decline and what that means is a far more intense focus on journalist safety around the world. You know, so I've spoken a little bit about why our department was founded, um, but again, we provide assistance to journalists who have faced harm or hardship in the course of their reporting. That might be a grant for medical support because somebody was injured while covering a protest. Increasingly, that's uh, legal support or the covering of uh, funding for at legal fees. Uh, that can be trauma support for the mental health um, outcomes of covering a difficult story. And increasingly, um, we cover the cost of basic needs for journalists who go into exile and really have nothing. Um, and we can assist them with paying of rent um, for food and in many cases, like basic needs such as clothing. When we think about journalist safety, we always think about three overlapping types of safety, physical safety, digital safety, and psychosocial safety. And we think about this over the course of a story. And there can be different risk points um, at different points, meaning before a story, during the course of your reporting, and once a story has been published. In a, uh, later on in the program, I can go into a bit more depth about exactly what we have uh, published this year in terms of safety. Um, but for, I will give you a couple of examples. We just uh, issued an advisory for covering the World Cup in Qatar. Um, we already saw, I think last night, a Danish uh, broadcast crew was stopped by Qatari authorities while they were reporting live. Authorities threatened to break the camera of that journalist um, and attempted to stop them filming. So the World Cup hasn't started yet and we, we can already see um, some press freedom violations taking place. I understand that Qatari, Qatari authorities have apologized, but nevertheless, that is not a good sign. Um, and our safety information tends to reflect what we hear from journalists and what we see with the press freedom landscape at large. So and earlier this year, later, there was a lot of reporting done on spyware and the use of Pegasus spyware. And so we have issued our own safety information about that. So journalists know exactly um, how they can protect themselves from what's going on. And I will finish then um, by speaking about journalists in exile. Um, I'm speaking to you all on the eve of CPJ's annual International Press Freedom Awards ceremony. And I think there'll be a link posted in the chat so you can find out more about our awardees. Um, we, we honor five journalists every year Two of the journalists this year are themselves journalists in exile. 
And this is absolutely an increasing, we, we see increasingly journalists needing to flee because they simply have no choice but to protect themselves and their families. Um, as as uh, Judy mentioned at the top, I became Emergencies direct, Director shortly after visiting Doha um, to help resettle a number of Afghan journalists that CPJ helped to evacuate uh, in late August of last year. So I saw firsthand and worked firsthand with journalists who, if they had not have been on a plane and they had not have been in the right place at the right time, it's unclear what would have happened to them. Um, and that was a very, you know, that was a very humbling experience. I've put here a few of the very common routes that we see journalists taking and have taken over the past year. This is not an exhaustive list, um, but these are the, the, general, the general routes that we see. Um, Afghan journalists fleeing into Pakistan. They also go to India, Iran, Turkmenistan. Uh, we see Nicaraguan journalists seeking refuge in Costa Rica, Ethiopian journalists going to Kenya, and Russian journalists going to Latvia and Georgia, where in many cases they are able to set up um, their newsrooms in exile and can start working as journalists again. Um, we have at CPJ supported journalists um, in all of these situations and all of these countries over the past year. Uh, the larger point that I want to make here is that journalists in exile and this increase in journalists fleeing their countries is absolutely a press freedom issue. Um, when journalists are being threatened to the extent that they have to leave, um, that is silencing and that is intimidation that is going on. Um, it's, it's meant that we as an organization are doing more work with organizations that we wouldn't necessarily work with, um, such as UNHCR or refugee agencies, but we absolutely welcome those, those relationships with those organizations. Um, and what I will say is going back to the IPFA awards, I'm very, very glad that we'll be able to honor, um, we have a Cuban journalist who's in exile and an Iraqi Kurdish journalist in exile as well. Um, and I want to just leave you on the positive note that one of them is at least here in the US and will be with us in person tomorrow evening. That is a, a kind of rapid look at CPJ's work on press freedom in decline. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, now let's learn a little bit more about our next distinguished speaker, Stephen Youngblood. Stephen is the founding director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism at Park University in Parkville, Missouri, where he is a communications and peace studies professor. He has organized and taught peace journalism seminars and workshops in 33 countries, most in person, but more recently some on Zoom. Stephen is a two-time Fulbright Scholar in Moldova in 2001 and Azerbaijan in 2007. He also served as a U.S. State Department Senior Subject Specialist in Ethiopia in 2018. Stephen edits the Peace Journalist magazine and writes and produces Peace Journalism Insights blog. He has been recognized for his contributions to world peace by the U.S. State Department, Rotary International, and the World Forum for Peace, which named him a Luxembourg Peace Prize Laureate for 2021. Distinguished speaker, Stephen Youngblood, would you begin your remarks, please? Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, Lucy, uh, I'm thrilled to have you with us tonight um, and to talk about the really outstanding work that CPJ does. In fact, I've been privileged to have worked with CPJ a few years back, CPJ, uh, really helped out a journalist colleague of mine in Kenya uh, who was under some pressure from the government. So I've seen firsthand the kind of really outstanding work that CPJ does. Um, so I'm going to uh, take a little different tack tonight and talk about uh, something that we call peace journalism. Um, so I'll give you a little introduction uh, into that, talking a little bit about the ways that media cover conflict, uh, an overview of peace journalism, and then talking about maybe pe how peace journalism relates to journalist safety. I think it's an interesting notion to consider that although many times journalists, uh, you know, can't control what happens to them, I do think, and my some of my colleagues agree, 
to an extent that we can help to mitigate some of the pot potential harm that might come our way as journalists. So any discussion of peace journalism begins with an examination of the ways that media cover conflict. And don't just think of war, but think of any type of conflict. Um, so it, it could be armed conflict, of course, but it could also be political conflict. It could be conflicts between uh, immigrants and host communities. So the, the, the discussion that we could have, and we could this could be tonight's discussion for three hours, is do media cover, how do media cover conflict and violence? Do they cover it responsibly? Do they cover it sensationally? Do media fuel conflict? And if so, how do they do it? And how does media coverage impact journalist safety? I think we could all agree, uh, even the most hardened supporters of the journalism profession could agree, uh, that we could do our job better. That sometimes the language that we use, the framing that we use, uh, that it can exacerbate conflict. Um, there are pl plenty of instances as well of journalists and journalism actually fueling conflict. I think the way that journalism operates, we look here in the United States, certainly deepens a political partisan divides. Um, so I think that, that in that sense, they're certainly part of the problem. So these same issues, these same deficits in media coverage have existed for a very long time. In fact, during the 1960s, a Norwegian academic named Dr. Johan Gautung looked at media and found it wanting. And he developed initially during the 60s, this concept of peace journalism. The idea that journalism can be better. So, by definition, peace journalism is when editors and reporters make choices that improve the prospects for peace. So these choices include how we frame stories, what words we use. The idea is to create an atmosphere conducive to peace and supportive of peace initiatives without compromising the principles of good journalism. So peace journalism gives peacemakers a voice while making peace initiatives and nonviolent solutions more visible and viable. What peace journalism isn't. So peace journalism is not open advocacy for peace. So we're not saying there must be peace, but we are leading discussions about peace. We are in the ways that we report attempting to at minimum, at least not incite conflict. What peace journalism is not, it's not good news. So if something bad happens, if a bomb goes off and people die, we have to report it, it's news. So peace journalism doesn't ask, do we report it? Peace journalism asks, how do we report it? How do we tell that story? Do we tell, us, tell the story in a way that's sensational, that encourages conflict, that fuels retribution and anger, or do we tell the story in a different way? And so that's just in a quick nutshell what peace journalism is. Now I'm sharing with you 10 characteristics of peace journalism. So what makes peace journalism peace journalism? First of all, peace journalism is proactive. We don't wait for a crisis to occur. We look proactively at potential crisis areas, and we talk about solutions. So you may have heard of solutions journalism. Peace journalism is all in favor of that. We just happen to believe that more is needed other than just reporting about solutions. That peace journalism rejects polarizing us versus them reporting. So we see this so prevalently. Uh, in the United States, right? Politically partisan reporting. Well, this can also be reflected in lots of places around the world. I recently finished a project with Indian and Pakistani journalism, journalists. And the journalism in India and Pakistan is very much us versus them. Instead, peace journalism seeks to build bridges, to begin dialogue 
between groups that might be in conflict. Peace reporters reject propaganda. Peace journalism rejects overly simple portrayals of issues and people. So portraying groups as monoliths. All Muslims believe this. All Trump supporters believe this. All Democrats believe this. So we know the world is a more complex place than that. And peace journalism reflects this complexity, reflects these gray areas. Peace journalism gives a voice to the voiceless. This is one of the key principles of peace journalism. So traditional journalism studies have found tends to be written for, by, for, and about elites. Peace journalism instead wants to talk to everyday people about their issues, about their concerns, about how the major issues impact them. So peace journalism is less interested in how climate change impacts oil companies and a lot more interested in how climate change impacts um, fishermen, small fishermen who are just making a day-to-day -day living. Peace journalists provide depth and context. If that sounds just like good journalism, I think it is. Peace journalists consider the consequences of their reporting. So if I report this story in this way, what happens? Will I inf inflame or incite violence? Peace journalists carefully choose and analyze the words they use. So you see some of those words below. Too often in traditional journalism, we use language that's simply sensational. Language that simply puts gasoline on the fire. Language that's subjective. Language that doesn't add anything to the reader's understanding of the story. Do we need to say, 10 people were slaughtered in a brutal, bloody massacre? Can't we just say 10 people were killed? The same goes with images. We carefully and thoughtfully select the images that we use. Why are we, why are we using this image? Is it clickbait or is, the, or is a bloody image necessary to tell the story? And finally, peace journalists offer counter narratives that debunk traditional media stereotypes and misperceptions about a given group. So when you think about um, Africa, for example, there are two or three traditional media narratives about Africa. Uh, that it's poor, uh, that it's disease-ridden, uh, that there are wars there. So it's very seldom that we hear African news that doesn't fit into one of those categories. Yet we know that there are 54 countries in Africa and a million, millions of different stories about Africa that go well beyond those three very narrow categories. So that's what a counter-narrative would talk about would talk about education in Africa or Africa as an engine for economic growth, a thousand such stories. So what does peace journalism look like? So we don't have time to go thoroughly through these stories, but traditional media often tells a story in the worst possible terms. Peace talks are in ruins, this story says. A traditional story is oftentimes one-sided, as this story is. A traditional story often uses the inflammatory language we talked about, massacre, mutilated. A traditional story highlights the violence, the bodies were cut with knives, and so on and so on. The, this peace journalism story is a little bit different. So the peace journalism story leads with, there was condemnation across the political spectrum after a police patrol suffered the loss of eight men. So instead of throwing our hands up and saying peace is hopeless, at least in this story, we're acknowledging some common ground. This story doesn't ignore what happened, but it doesn't sensationalize it either. Notice that the inflammatory language is gone, right? Notice also that the story is balanced much more quickly. So that's a, a, a small, quick example of the difference between peace journalism and traditional journalism. So in the 30 countries that I've 
visited face-to-face -to, -face to do peace journalism seminars, one of the most interesting and challenging was Cameroon. I don't know how familiar you are with Cameroon, but it's in West Africa. And essentially Cameroon is divided into two parts, a French speaking or Francophone part and an English speaking or Anglophone part. Since 2017, there's been an ongoing insurgency. Don't know if you could call it a civil war, but certainly a violent conflict between the Anglophones who have felt marginalized and the majority ruling party Francophones. So it's against this backdrop that my colleagues and I did peace journalism seminars throughout Cameroon in 2017 and 2018. And so one of the things that I did as part of these seminars was I, I brought up the question to the journalists. Do you believe that you are safer if you practice peace journalism? So if you practice the kind of non-sensational, non-inflammatory journalism versus traditional journalism, do you think the practice of peace journalism makes you safer? And so I conducted a survey in different regions of the country, and this is what I found. So the scale is one to five, five is being the most severe threat. Now, journalists there say that they are under threat from both officials and police, and from separatist rebels. So you see from the chart that both traditional journalists in red and peace journalists in blue, that there are certainly threats are there from, from both sides, right? But I think that you see, at least according to these journalists, a substantial reduction of the threat for those who practice peace journalism. And the journalists told me that they believe that this is the case because the peace journalism seeks a middle ground, that the peace, jur peace journalism doesn't seek uh, to sensationalize something bad that's happened, doesn't try to make angry people angrier. Um, and that when you practice peace journalism, that you build your own credibility. And they seem to believe that credibility uh, can provide at least a partial shield against threats, intimidation, arrest, and violence uh, from both officials and police and separatists and rebels. So I thought this was really interesting. I, this is a small study, and it's certainly nothing publishable or definitive. Um, and I think that it provides grist for a lot further study on this, because I, I, in my interactions with journalism, journalists around the world, um, I think the general consensus is that journalists can make themselves safer. Now, not safe, but safer. That journalists can make themselves safer through their own conduct. And we can talk to Lucy a little bit about that too. So this is my contact information. I encourage you to uh, contact me at any time. Uh, the Center for Global Peace Journalism is at park.edu slash peacecenter where you can find information about our projects. You can also find issues of the Peace Journalist Magazine, which we publish uh, twice a year. So I look, uh, thank you for giving me the time to make my presentation. And I look forward to a robust discussion in the next few minutes. Thank you, Stephen. So we're gonna try something a little different tonight with our, our Q&A session when we open it. Um, we know many of you have questions for our speakers tonight. Um, they have varied backgrounds. If you would hold those for just a few minutes, we would like to offer our presenters an opportunity to ask a question of each other first. So Stephen, would you like to ask Lucy a question? Sure. Um, hi, Lucy. Hi, Steve. <laughs> so what uh, what are some of the safety issues that that journalists are facing right now? And more importantly, what can journalists and their organizations do to help individual journalists prepare for what they're going to face? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that question, Steve. So as I said during my presentation, generally, the safety threats journalists everywhere are always facing fall into the broad categories of phys the uh, threats to their physical safety, 
threats to their digital safety, and then also their psychosocial safety, their mental health. Increasingly, we are seeing legal threats coming into this landscape um, in a really troubling way. Um, this is legal intimidation. It's in some cases known as lawfare. So the almost creative use of, of the law to hamper journalists and intimidate them. Um, this might be, you know, instead of defamation or a libel lawsuit, which is something that we traditionally associate with, with journalism, it might be through taxes um, or things about um, the space in which your office is held and, and using and weaponizing the law in that way. So, um, so have we seen, I'm sorry for interrupting it, have we seen um, weaponizing of, co of COVID, COVID vaccines and so on, have, have regulations around that been used to, uh, to attack journalists? Around vaccines, no. But certainly um, earlier in the pandemic, we saw things like restriction on where you could go. So not being able to go into hospitals or not being able to interview certain people, even information that was published, even though that was credible information um, was clamped down on in some countries. Um, that includes both, you know, journalism in the more traditional sense where it's in a newspaper or on a website but also the social media posts of some journalists you know obviously there are some journalists around the world who primarily rely on facebook or primarily rely on telegram as a means of getting their information out um, in terms of cpj we have published um you know we just published this advisory on safely covering the world cup we had one earlier in the year about covering the winter olympics um, both of these particular advisories are on uh, really focus on digital safety and the threats um, that kind of uh, uh, surveillance threats around bringing your devices into to those countries. Um, earlier this year, following the, the deaths of, of journalist Dom Phillips um, and uh, Bruno Pereira in Brazil, um, we published what I consider to be one of our best um, safety advisories, which was how to sub safely cover the Amazon basin. Um, and that included a lot of detail on, you know, the cultural context of the risks to your sources and your producers, um, the various, the various, you know, um, there are environmental activists that are facing off against mining interests, who are facing off against police, and the for journalists, both local and those who are going in, um, very detailed information, even on how to travel safely on a boat. Um, in terms of newsrooms. Generally, I would say that newsrooms need to treat journalist safety as an integral part of reporting at this point. So treating it as an inevitability that something may happen to your journalists, preparing for the worst is far, far better than having one of your journalists be exposed to an attack of online harassment. Um, and then, as, especially with the way twi Twitter is these days, for example, trying to then um, uh, trying to kind of play catch up once once that's happened. Um, I also want to just point out that we have general advisories as well, everything from reporting on flash floods um, to protecting your journalists against online smear campaigns. We also have some information for journalists who are reporting in areas where mines um, and unexploded ordnance um, are present. That was a direct response to the war in Ukraine, but we of course recognize that there are many other countries around the world where those materials are present. Thank you. And it's all at cpj.org. It's all at cpj.org. Links will be with you following um, this presentation. Yes, all at cpj.org. Um, and I have a question for you, Steve, if you don't mind. Um, so when we were chatting a little bit you know, ahead of this panel last month, we spoke about uh, your work with journalists in India and Pakistan, and you have touched on that briefly. Um, and I was very interested in these the, the survey that you did. Um, I've reported from Cameroon myself and seeing those numbers, um, you know, journalists compared to peace journalism and journalist safety, it's fascinating. So when we um, when we're talking about journalists for change and the the project with journalists in India and Pakistan, can you tell us a little bit more about that cross border reporting project um, and also the safety concerns? For journalists from either country, because CPJ has done quite a bit of reporting on both countries this year. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so first of all, about the project. 
uh, it, 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 it was supposed to be a year long project and thanks to COVID, it was a three year project. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was a project that was a cross border reporting project that involved Indian and Pakistani journalists. So the project was um, run by the East West Center based in Honolulu. So I was one of several um, experts and consultants trainers that worked with the journalists. So the idea was that the journalists would get from the different country, from India and Pakistan would get together and then jointly report on issues of mutual concern. So I'm sharing that screen now. Their uh, website is called Journalists for Change. And it talks about um, the project that I just mentioned. And it's a place where these stories are reported. Now, these aren't, you'll notice, these aren't political stories. So these are issues of mutual concern. So there's a lot of reporting about climate change, which, as you know, in South Asia is severe. There's a lot of reporting about COVID and vaccines, about women's rights, about, um, here's some more stories here about things like um, water, about agriculture, um, cultural issues, uh, mental health, and so on. And so these journalists, uh, we've been meeting over Zoom, and then we finally got together in Hawaii last summer um, to, uh, to put an exclamation mark on the project. And so in working with these journalists over the last three years, I've heard many, many stories. And Lucy, I know you, you won't be surprised to hear, uh, but India and Pakistan are two of the most difficult places in the world to work as a journalist. And I, I'll especially point out um, the issues with female journalists. So we know, and the CPJ has been a leading light shining light on this. We know that, uh, that male journalists certainly face threats, but that those threats are multiplied uh, for female journalists. Uh, there was an interesting new study I just read yesterday uh, that told us about the, the risks that female journalists face online, uh, a harassment of online female journalists at, at a rate five or 10 times their male counterparts. And I found that with the Indian and Pakistani journalists as well. Uh, so the, the male journalists uh, seem, um, although they were concerned about collaborating with the other side, uh, they weren't so concerned where they felt like they needed to conceal their identity or, or to not have their photo published. Uh, many of the female journalists didn't feel like that was the case. And so for many of the journalists we met in Hawaii from both India and Pakistan, the female journalists did not want their pictures taken or did not want their names used uh, because of the harassment that they would face for an Indian journal journalist, the harassment of working with Pakistanis and for a Pakistani journalist, the harassment of working with an Indian. And this is even more acute when we talk about journalists from the Kashmir region. Um, so I did a project in Kashmir uh, six or seven years ago. Um, so you all, I won't go into the history of that. Um, so the Kashmir region has been disputed since the partition of 1947. Most of it is in India. There's a small part of Kashmir called Azad Kashmir that's in Pakistan and an even smaller part that's in China. And so Indian Kashmir has been disputed since 1947. And the journalists there are especially under the thumb of the Indian government. So anything that's written that's, that's anti-government policy is seen as pro-rebel, pro um, is seen as pro-Pakistan. So any sort of criticism of the government is essentially verboten. And for those who, um, for those who don't toe the line, particularly in Kashmir, um, jailings, beatings, uh, disappearances are unfortunately um, de rigueur. Uh, 
In fact, one of the journalists, when I was in Pakistan, I work with a journalist called Syed, uh, um, Syed Bukhari. So Bukhari ran a, web, ran a newspaper called Rising Kashmir. And he and I even talked about this safety issue. And he told me that he, he said, I think I'm safer because I practice peace journalism. Well, about a year after I, maybe two years, after I was in Kashmir, Bukhari and his bodyguards were murdered in broad daylight with impunity right outside their newspaper. Um, and so that certainly had an understandable and chilling effect. So yeah, India and Pakistan, in terms of journalist safety, my experience is two very, very difficult places. I, I'm assuming that's your, your observation as well, Lucy. Yes, you can see that I'm nodding my head vigorously um, because that is indeed what we experience at CPJ. I think the, the study you're referring to, Steve, I think is the chilling from the ICFJ. That's it, yes. yes that's I, can, it. I will share that link because it's a Thank fantastic um, study. And just on, on Kashmir as well, um, it, just a recent example of how, how journalists are treated in the region. There was a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who was recently um, barred, I think for the second time from leaving the country to come here to New York to accept her Pulitzer Prize for photography. I saw that. Um, yeah. And her, um, her name is Sana Matu. Um, this has been reported publicly, but she, um, the photos she took was actually very, um, it, it showed the Indian government's COVID response in a positive light. Um, and still, even though that was her photo, she was she was barred from coming here again. And she's not the only journalist from Kashmir um, to experience that that block, blocking of leaving the country. So absolutely. And again, India last year, that was the the country with the most number of journalists killed. So that really does align. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, distinguished speakers, for your interchange and the good questions. Um, we learn more and more each, each sentence. <laughs> and now it is time uh, to turn it over to my co-moderator, Ian McIntosh, for the open question and answer from all of our guests online. Yes, thanks so much, Judy. And thanks, uh, Steve and Lucy and, and Betty. So now in this uh, second part of the program, we, we want to hear from you and your questions. Uh, now, uh, the system has been set up, so if you go to chat uh, and click on chat, the questions will come directly to me. Now, either I can ask them uh, on your behalf or I can call on you, uh, and in which case uh, you will unmute, uh, ask the question, and then you yourself back up again. Now, we've already got a couple of questions that have come in for, uh, uh, for Steve, but I wanted to uh, uh, kick us off, the mod moderator's prerogative, uh, as we say, with a question for Lucy. Uh, Lucy. There are many long-term conflicts and crises continuing to play out across the world, including the war in Ukraine and the aftermath of the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. How does CPJ help journalists who are caught up in these situations? Uh, thank you so much, Ian, for that, that excellent question. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, a couple of years ago, or you know, three or four years ago, it seemed like we were dealing with one major crisis at a time. Um, right now, we are we are dealing with overlapping huge humanitarian conflicts that, of course, involve journalists. Um, when we think about, I'll just go back to to last August and to Afghanistan quickly to give you an example of how my department works in a situation like this. Um, we, you know, we we knew from early 2021 that something very bad would happen in Afghanistan later in the year, um, just from hearing from journalists who had already started fleeing the country in January or February. Um, if a journalist decides to leave their country um, and there are, there are demonstrated threats against them, we are able to assist with a grant. Um, we were able to do that, and we are still continuing to do that with journalists in Afghanistan, whether they choose to stay within the country and internally relocate, or they have managed to make it out which is rarer and rarer these days um, as well. In a situation like Ukraine, we are not seeing that mass displacement of journalists like we did with Afghanistan. Um, many journalists have chosen to stay in Ukraine to cover the conflict in their, in their home country. Um, of course, men, it's, it's, it's difficult for men of military age to leave. Um, so we are 
the journalists who do decide to leave are largely women. And again, we are able to help them with a grant for three months, um, an emergency grant, so they can basically get back on their feet um, and start, start a new life. Um, in all of these cases, we do our best to work with local partners on the ground. Um, in Ukraine, a, a good example is uh, the 20, 2402 fund. Um, I would encourage everyone to, to look them up. They are a project of Zaborona Media. Um, shortly after the war broke out, there was, of course, an enormous sudden need for things like PPE, um, generators, battery chargers. Um, when we're talking about PPE, of course, I'm talking about personal protective equipment such as helmets, bulletproof vests, um, goggles, that kind of thing. So of uh, first aid kits as well, absolutely. So we, um, as an example, were able to provide a grant to Zaborona Media to pay for about 100 first aid kits for journalists. So there's many different ways that we can go about um, helping journalists in crisis. Excellent, thank you. So now the, yes, the questions are coming in thick and fast. And now there, there's two for Steve, and I'll, I'll read the first one from uh, Beth uh, Bone, and then I'll have- Yeah, I, I'm only good for one at a time. It's that <laughs> short-term memory of an elderly person. Yeah, so Beth first, and then I'll have Larry ask you a question, then we'll come back to, uh, to Lucy. So from Beth, are there any outlets like the BBC or NPR that actively advocate for peace journalism? Well, I, I don't know that there are any outlets that would that would call themselves peace journalism, but I think it's certainly out there. Um, this kind of, we can see this sort of responsible reporting. Um, you mentioned NPR, I always mention NPR, PBS. Um, there are individual journalists who practice this sort of journalism. Uh, I was really sorry to see uh, Nicholas Kristof leave the New York Times. I think that a, a lot of his work really spotlighted uh, the voiceless people in our world, the kind of thing that peace journalism does. And, and, you know, through the work of peace journalism advocates, not just myself, but many others, uh, peace journalism is practiced in a lot of places that your audience would never have, uh, would never have access to. Uh, there are radio stations in rural Uganda dedicated to uh, these peace journalism principles. I've worked with journalists in Turkey uh, who have improved the kinds of reporting they do about refugees so that it more, more accurately, so, so that it's not reflexively negative. So there are all, all sorts of, of these sorts of examples. Uh, but, but in a corporate for-profit uh, media environment, um, obviously peace journalism is going to have a tough time flourishing. Larry, a follow-up. Larry, uh, yeah, follow-up. Th yeah, thanks, Ian, and, and thanks to uh, both Lucy and Steve for your your comments and for being there with both with your, with your organizations and with with yourselves uh, dedicating yourselves to this important topic. Based on what you've said, uh, can we assume that press freedom can really only exist, or that that peace journalism could only really exist in a place where you have true press freedoms? And the second part of that question, and you both think so. Let, let me take the first part first. Like okay. I said, short term yeah. memory. Okay. So it, it's a really interesting question, and in until so I've been doing this about fifteen years, and until just a few years ago, I wasn't sure the answer to that question. Um, so I did a semester long project in Ethiopia. I was based at at Gondar University in northern Ethiopia very close to Tigray, where the conflict has been occurring. Um, and one of the things that I did as part of this project was uh, the embassy sent me around the country, meeting with journalists, journalism organizations, and so on. So on a couple of opportunities, I met with journalists at state TV and state radio. And when they wanted me to meet with them, I, I, I kind of thought to myself, well, what? I how can I possibly do any good here? And it, it was interesting. They, they really opened my eyes to the fact that you know, they're not going to be able to balance their stories with opposition points of view. That's true. But if you look at those 10 principles of peace journalism, there's some of that stuff they can do. I mean, they can give a voice to the voiceless. They can report in a way that's less inflammatory. Um, they can offer counter narratives that debunk stereotypes. 
there's so there are some of these things they can do. To take this to an extreme example, um, earlier or last spring, I met with a group on Zoom of a dozen Chinese journalists. And again, my reaction was the same thing, Chinese journalists, but they told me the same thing that, uh, sorry about the dog, by the way. If anyone would like a free dog, let me know. Uh, she's now for sale. <laughs> At any rate, I met with these Chinese journalists and essentially they told me the same thing as the Ethiopian journalists. They said, look, you know, we work for the government, but there's some of these principles that we can use to improve our reporting. So I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, uh, it kind of leads to the second question, which is with the rise of more authoritarian leaders that we're seeing around the world who are clamping down more on this, is there room for a balanced story or is propaganda what is required to keep your freedom as a journalist? Well, I mean, that's that's a really good question, right? And I think that, you know, we've, we've, we've seen examples of authoritarianism on the march, but we've also seen it on the wane. Uh, so we did see Bolsonaro, for, for example, lost in Brazil, which I think is was a happy day for uh, for journalism, certainly. Um, so wherever there's authoritarian control of, of journalism uh, and, and there's the threat or, or there's actual violence or retribution against journalists or even the threat of it, of course it has a chilling effect on journalists. I mean, journalists are human too. And when I've worked with journalists in places like Cameroon and Northern Uganda, um, Nigeria and so on, some of my first advice is before you practice any journalism, rule number one is be safe and, and, and take care of yourself. And, um, and of course that's harder when in an authoritarian situation. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with that, Lucy? Yeah, I'm just thinking, I mean, I, I do agree with you, Steve. Um, I, I would say that there are many organizations like CPJ, but we are, of course, not the only organization doing this. There are watchdog organizations around the world that will shine a light on those who choose to do the important work of independent journalism in an, in an authoritarian regime. The point about Bolsonaro is absolutely correct. Um, that was a very positive day for journalism, knowing how difficult it's been in Brazil. Um, I would say that Russia is, of course, an extreme example of what can happen um, and kind of the end of the line where we have heard from journalists, uh, Russian journalists, the independent media there is essentially dead for all intents and purposes. Um, but when you are when you are living somewhere and you are still doing that important independent journalism, I don't think propaganda is the only answer. Um, and there are people who are watching out for you to make sure that if you do end up in prison or you are arrested, that the rest of the world will know about it. So I know this isn't on the agenda, but I can I ask you a question really quickly, Lucy? So, yeah. so as I watched um, the um, presidential uh, announcement last night of a certain candidate, um, we both know, we all know that this candidate is well known for his vitriol directed against the press. And much has been written about how Trump's anti-press uh, tirades have, have empowered, uh, legitimized authoritarians overseas who want to uh, attack the press, who want to marginalize the press. So as, the news unfolded that he's running for president again. What, what was your thought about how this could, what sort of impact this could have on the press here in the US and internationally? Great question. Um, I worked as a reporter here in the US during the first, uh, when Trump was president and I moved to CPJ in the middle of that time. So I saw firsthand how the rhetoric that was espoused was dangerous to both journalists in this country, and you're totally right, Steve, that it did empower 
other leaders, including leaders um, who we can describe as authoritarian, echo the language of enemies of the people, um, you know, fake news, et cetera. Bolsonaro, o Orban, and so on. That's correct. Um, my thought was that, you know, if, if he is running, if he's chosen again, we are in a place where we've, we've dealt with this before. We have seen now that it's not like that rhetoric is suddenly going to go away. Um, so in a way, we are prepared. It's not new anymore, right? So that rhetoric has been used for many years at this point. Um, I would say in this country, at least now, it's fairly entrenched among parts of the population that simply don't like the press. What I'm always concerned about in the US um, are protests and unrest that can get out of hand um, and that will result in the arrests of journalists like we saw in 2020. That's always my fear that that will happen again on a large scale. Um, but with, with Trump deciding to, to run for president again, we kind of know what to expect at this point. I'm not super worried. We've already dealt with it, um, but I'm never quite fully relaxed <laughs> about any of this stuff. Can I jump again in quickly on the same topic? Is there something about right-wing authoritarian uh, governments that leads towards more restrictions or less press freedom. Uh, I mean, right and left are different things in different countries, I think, but what we're seeing with Bolsonaro and in, in uh, the Philippines and, and uh, um, you know, Hungary and so forth is these are generally right wing conservative who feel that they have to muzzle the, uh, the, the voice of the opposition. Sure. Um, we, we, will, we will report and issue alerts and statements wherever there are journalists at risk and at threat, uh, who are being threatened, um, no matter the political leaning of, of that country. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, after all, the, the Soviet Union was leftist and uh, their, their record with journalists was hardly sterling. Yeah. And I don't think you'd call China a right wing uh, government either so it, it uh yeah yeah right uh, good well you've answered one one of the questions that came up about the the, uh, the safety of journalists in this country uh but let's uh, uh, lucy there's a few questions for you uh okay. that i'll give in sequence and then uh, back to steve after that with a few that are coming but uh, lucy one of them is uh, where does funding for cpj come from Yes, um, we do not take any government funding. It comes from individual donations and it comes from foundations as well. Very good. So the, the next one uh, is, um, what particular risks are faced by freelance journalists and independent journalists globally? Yes, um, we pay particular attention to freelance journalists because they tend to lack the traditional support of a newsroom. And that isn't to say that every single newsroom in the world has a dedicated safety team or even one person that can dedicate their whole time to that. But with freelancers in particular, um, they, are, they are lacking that support and they are often reporting alone. Um, if I can use a US example, because somebody did ask about um, threats to journalists here. And this is something I spent an awful lot of time working on during the 2020 protests. Um, we saw nationwide many, many journalists being arrested um, across the US, despite the fact that they clearly showed a press pass. They clearly had press credentials on them. That was something in this country that was fairly new. And it was a deviation from the norm because that usually should protect you in many cases in 2020 in the US, it didn't. For freelancers, um, you know, it, they might not have something that ties them to a newsroom. Not every single newsroom can issue a press pass for a freelancer at short notice. Many journalists who are freelance who are reporting on those protests weren't even working for a particular client. So that does make them automatically less safe because they don't have that credential, but also who do they ring? Who do they call? Um, we know that reporting alone, wherever you are, uh, is generally an, a less safe way of going about things. For freelancers, that's often just how they operate. Um, that's where we step in. There's also a fantastic organization in the US called Re the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, or RCFP, CPJ, RCFP, 
we're a, an industry of acronyms. Um, but if you can, they have a legal hotline 24 seven. So we always encourage journalists in this country at least, but especially freelancers who might not have access to the legal counsel at a newsroom. They might not have access um, to someone who can come and get them if they're arrested. Always use that hotline. But now uh, we have a question from uh, Tess for Michael uh, about Eritrea. Tess for Michael, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and open your camera and ask your question? Yes, thank you, Ian. Uh, firstly, Ian and uh, Lucy, thank you very much for uh, your enlightening presentation on uh, what is often called the fourth pillar freedom of press, uh, a freedom of press that we often take for granted here in the West. I am originally from uh, Eritrea, and uh, my question is directed to Lucy. Uh, you may know that in Eritrea in 2001, uh, the backdrop of the 9-11, there was a crackdown on uh, the press. All private newspapers were closed. The 15 uh, reporters, or journalists were arrested and nobody knows their whereabouts. Uh, it's reported that some of them have died in prison. Some of them over the last 20 years have, you know, God knows what. So I was quite surprised and really saddened to see that Eritrea wasn't on the list of five countries along with Afghanistan and Iran and Ukraine and so does CG, uh, CPJ have any information on what's going on in Eritrea? The situation is still as dark as a, a black box. Nothing comes out. There is no freedom of press. There is only government sponsored uh, media. So what does CPJ have on Eritrea? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tess for Michael. So on our data, um, it is important for me to point out that we, we use the information that is that we can get and that is available to us. For example, that you know, people often ask me about North Korea. Um, and why isn't North Korea listed on any of these census um, censuses that you do? And because we don't, we simply don't have the information in order to make a report or make a tally or do any reporting. Um, the case that you're referring to, uh, I do not have off the top of my head any, any additional information for you, but I would be more than happy to connect with you offline and connect you to my colleagues who work specifically um, in the region who would be far better placed um, to answer that question than myself. Um, I would also encourage you to go to the CPJ website where we, we, we I think in uh, July of this year, we published a, a letter encouraging the release of Eritrean journalists who are in prison. But as you say, um, the something of an information black hole does make it very difficult for us to do um, su substantial reporting. So if you'd like to share your email address um, with someone on this call, either Ian uh, or Judy, I'd be more than happy to follow up with you afterwards. Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, if you could just put it in the chat and that, that will come direct to me. And thank, uh, you, so, thank you very much for your question. Thank you. So Steve, a couple of questions for you. Now, uh, this is from Barbara Hayes. Uh, are there specific tenets of peace journalism applied to photojournalism? Yes. Um, so one of, the, one of the 10 rules talked about how peace journalists carefully select the images that we use, because we know that images that are uh, merely sensational, that are only bloody, uh, can certainly re-traumatize, can make a bad situation worse. So you've heard me talk about pouring gasoline on the fire. Certainly there are images that do that. Uh, so when I talk about images with my students, we'll go over a number of iconic images and talk about whether it's appropriate to use those or not. So there's an, an, an uh, image taken a few years ago of uh, the body of a young boy 
uh, I, Alan Kurdi, who washed up in Turkey. He was a Syrian refugee. And there's a photo of a, of a policeman carrying him and photos of his body on the beach. So we talk about the appropriateness of, of using that. Uh, there's another story from, uh, there's another photo from years ago, 30 years ago, maybe, of a, uh, of a small child. And you can see uh, who's obviously starving and you can see a buzzard in the background. Uh, so we also talk about the advisability of that kind of thing. Uh, one of the examples that I show is an example taken from maybe four or five years ago in the New York Times. Uh, there was a terrorist attack in Kenya at a hotel. And, um, and unfortunately, I don't remember the number, but five or 10 people were killed. And the photo that they used in the New York Times is a very graphic photo of dead bodies on a veranda who were killed by the terrorists. And I wrote about this extensively. And what I said was, you know, I challenged the New York Times to, to, to admit that they would never have run this photo if these were, uh, if these were Americans in uh, Tampa, you know, or wherever, right? And so, you know, the, it's, it's interesting, the sort of values that are reflected in, in, in photojournalism. So yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the same notion that that photos can build bridges, that photos can accurately tell a story without uh, being needlessly inflammatory, um, I think that that they're equally as important as words. And not just photos, but images, video as well. Great, thanks. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Rajib Sanyal if you could uh, unmute and turn your camera Ron, for your question, please, for Steve. Rajib. All right, I'll ask Rajib's question. So. Yeah, uh, why don't you ask for me? Oh, no, Rajib, if you're there, please. There you are. Yeah, Very good. okay. So I have been following news ever since I was a small boy, uh, ever since I could read. And I'm now an old man, and I'm convinced that the so-called free press is very selective in the type of stories they present, how they present, and the reporters or journalists are bringing their own biases, perspectives, and the views of the societies in which they are based and where they live. So any news journalist story, I take with a grain of salt today. I've learned it the hard way. I'd like to hear from both of you about what I'm saying. So Lucy, would you like me to start? Sure. Okay, okay. So, it, so in terms of biases, um, one of the things that the, the journalists I train, the students I, that I teach, one of the things we talk about is that this, this notion of pure journalistic, journalistic objectivity, that it's a fantasy, that we all have biases. And so I think the best that we can do as journalists is to recognize those biases and to try to mitigate those as, as much as possible. And indeed, try to reach outside of our biases. So this is why I think projects like the India-Pakistan project I'm working on are so important because journalists, people on both sides have biases. But once you reach out and you make that individual contact and you start working together, you realize that a lot of these biases were flawed. So any project that I can work on that helps to build bridges, I think is a way to, to break through these biases. So the, the, uh, the biases between Syrian refugees and Turks, or Syrian refugees and Germans for that matter, or between um, English speaking and Spanish speaking Americans, all sorts of biases. And that's why for me, that when we practice peace journalism, we try to get rid of these us versus them stereotypes and reach across boundaries all the while recognizing 
that we're biased creatures and that the bias is not going anywhere. Lucy? Yeah, um, I can respond by, you know, just by saying that I, I, I hear where you're coming from, um, absolutely. But it's it's the job of CPJ and and my work especially to you know focus on all journalists um, from all different backgrounds from all sides um, if they are under threat or if they are at risk that is when we step in and we encourage you know a plurality of journalism to encourage a free press. Good, thank you. So now Yash Paul, is this your question about the possibility of whitewashing of news? Is that your question? No, 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 no. Right. So we'll come no. back to you in just a minute, then, because this, uh, hold on one sec. So we'll get this question, then I'll come back to you. So uh, okay. now this, this phone, this question comes from iPhone, iPhone Mary. Uh, iPhone Mary, would you like to uh, identify yourself? That's a great name, isn't it? IPhone, iPhone Mary. Three, Hi. two, one. Yes, please. Hi, that's, that's my question. Um, All right, so I can read it out for you if you like. Thank you. All right, so uh, Mary, I think that's your name. What uh, whitewashing? Whitewashing of the news of not showing what the world should know. She references the the photograph of the young and naked Vietnamese girl running down the road in the wall. But this concept of whitewashing does that resonate, uh, uh, Steve or Lucy? So, so one of one of the very first statements that you heard me make during my presentation was that peace journalism doesn't ignore news. So news is news. So the question isn't whether we report it, but how do we report it? So would I have shown the photo of the napalm girl in Vietnam? Yes. Would I have shown the photo of the young boy who washed up on the Turkish shore? Yes. Would I have shown bloody photos of terrorist victims from Kenya? No. So we're not whitewashing anything. It's not that we're not going to report about what happened in Kenya, but I think that there's a way to do it without exacerbating the situation, without making angry people angrier, and all the while respecting the victims as well. Right. Lucy, any comment there? Um, an interesting question, but not necessarily an area that CPJ um, tends to weigh to weigh in on. What I would say is that it's uh, it's the choice of a newsroom. These are decisions that happen within the news industry. Um, perhaps they are changed or they are reflected from their audience, from their readers, from their listeners. Um, but this is uh, not really an area that CPJ can speak Good. about. Thank you. Now we, we have time for one more question. And uh, Yashpal, do you have a question? Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I'm like Rajiv. Okay. Uh, the India Pakistan was mentioned. I was seven years old in 1947, and I saw uh, hangings and killings with my own eyes. Okay, I was very, uh, um, I don't know what, what words to use, but I just had one question, why the heck all this is taking place? And that has been my routine since then. And my uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, uh, okay, when he, when he became president, I was 20 years old and he was my absolute favorite, <laughs> okay? And I'm following events from Korean War and this and that all the way. I came to this country in 1966. Okay, so and my always question was that all this reporting, all this talk, what is all this about? Okay, and my sense it has been mentioned. You mentioned about peace journalism and so on. So, but I think that the the the, the basic purpose of journalism, as I see it, free press and so on all of those ideas are actually derived because you do some good to solve the problem, okay? Whereas I see that it is more of a business. You see, talk about say, that uh, whatever picture you are presenting, it looks good, it sells. So it depends on the, the interest of the readers, why they're reading the news. Some read it for, for, for fun or mm -hmm. some want to see solve the problem you have all kinds of customers. So my question is really, 
that do they teach one what is the purpose of journalism or something like that? Because actually, this is the first time I'm attending a meeting of journalists. All right, good. So I, I guess my my short answer to that would be that that journalists that that journalists uh, serve the public, that they don't serve a political party, they don't serve um, a, a racial or an ethnic group, that they serve the public. Um, and I think that practicing some of practicing these peace journalism principles is a way of serving the public. So that's that's a short answer, but that's what I believe. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Lucy, uh, final words, Lucy? I was going to say, Yash, um, looked like he was talking, but was muted. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything. OK, OK, I would I would echo Steve um, and I would say that, again, what it comes down to is that journalism is the core of a free democracy, right? Um, and whenever we see journalists or a free press under attack, that tends to be a symptom that not all is well in that society. So we, we do the best we can to protect journalists, to protect a free press. Um, and, and that's really what it boils down to. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much, Steve and Lucy and to everyone. I want to hand back to uh, uh, Betty now uh, for concluding remarks. When are we ever going to learn that? After how many years we could go through 10 more years of this and not unmute ourselves? Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lucy, very much. Uh, the questions indicated that this was a provocative uh, topic. It provoked thought, questions, uh, and we never have enough time to get everyone's in. And I, I feel bad about that. You did leave your contacts. I hope that, that groups do follow up with you. I hope that that groups follow this, uh, that they go to your organization, Lucy, and they follow Steve, what you're doing as well. I think for a lot of people that divining force, peace journalism was probably new for a lot of people. And it gives us all now a good opportunity to really, to really examine when we, when we, when we, um, a lot of us are teachers, um, and we're, we're, we, we ask our students to bring things in from distinguishing between mainstream media and, and all the blogs and so forth, um, and, and how they can do research for good unbiased uh, material. And I think even us as adults, you know, when we're, I will say that when I read a piece the next time, I will be looking at it from that lens. So thank you very much because it does influence then our opinion. And um, yes, I want to thank each of you again for joining us. Again, this is our last uh, program for this year. We will not meet in December. December is too packed with other things. We're not going to compete with it. And uh, I, Claire, I, I, I think we're having a holiday party. I think it's going to be just sort of for the board. It's not going to be a big widespread. People are still not coming out like they used to. In the old days, people might remember we tried to have a much larger party. We want it's you to come back. Members. It's for the members, not just the board. But you oh, have to la, la. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm starting. It's for the members. And that sounds to me like another member benefit. <laughs> so it's not too late to become a member. And I want to say that it's being held in the home of Sue Tempero. So Sue is a board member. She's on this evening. And we want to thank her. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a bring and share. So you can't just come in and eat and buy. You got to bring and share and it'll make it good. But members, did you hear that? It's for another member benefit. Um, now, please come back and join us again in January. Uh, we are going to be talking, Fiona Hill is going to join us. We're going to be talking about Ukraine. It's been one year uh, that, um, or it's going to be a year after the first of the year, that Putin invaded a sovereign nation. And something that uh, the, the, for the decades of alliances and peace that has taken place since the end of World War II, Putin simply doesn't pay any attention to. And um, you might remember Fiona Hill. She's currently with the Brookings Institute, uh, but we would remember, or many would remember her as a witness in the 2019 House hearing and the first impeachment inquiry of Donald Trump. 
and she has uh, quite an authority in Ukraine and uh, in the area was going on and also with Russia. Uh, so please join us. That'll be on January the 19th. I think that's going to be very exciting. We're thrilled to have her. She's a friend of the Council of World Affairs, and we're thrilled to have her join us. Um, and I encourage you again as a think of a Christmas present to yourself, not to the Indiana Council of World Affairs, but to yourself to become a member. It's only $50. And you can, if you join now, you can participate in the benefit of coming to our party and meet us live. Now that would be really, really cool, really fun. So with nothing further, I want to say whatever you celebrate between now and the end of the year, do so with joy and do so with peace. Thank you for making our year so special. Thank you.